Look, the aim of today um, is, I've, a, I've worked with Aaron on this presentation. He gave a similar one at an update in Tamworth uh, early, late last year. Um, I'll put my own spin on it because I had to present it. So, um, but it's, it's a similar focus of the presentation. So what I really want to do today is talk about this generally, about how the, uh, the need for, for reducing emissions and then uh, some of the options that we've got on farms. And then I'm going to specifically focus in on soil carbon. Um, and then uh, in a second presentation I'll give a bit later this afternoon, I'll talk about a pilot soil carbon uh, project that we've run here, uh, which has been running for over 10 years now. Um, and has, so we've got some really good local data that helps us to understand sort of what is achievable and what's not. And so it's, it's a good opportunity to sort of help with that. So you've probably all seen uh, graphs like this or, or um, have heard this concept of net zero. Both our federal and state government have signed up to net zero, which means that we have to get our greenhouse gas emissions to roughly equal out between what we're emitting and what we're storing by 2050. Um, that is a massive task and it will impact agriculture substantially. And so uh, what I want to try and do today is to give you a bit of an idea about some of the things you can do uh, and to understand that this is an evolving space. We can't give you a pathway today that you can go home and, and follow and, and, and meet what's needed. It, it will be an evolving space and you will have to continually, uh, I suppose, be updating yourselves to make sure you're in the best position to deal with this. Um, one of the other things that's, that's really driving this as well is that um, the supply chain, so the people that you supply your product to have made a lot of pledges around this, so, and very large pledges. So I've just put up a, a snapshot of the uh, pledges here. Um, and and you've seen, you would have seen some of these companies, but. Uh, I'll, I'll highlight a few of these. So JBS, one that you may be supplying some of your meat products to um, in, in this part of the world. Uh, they've made this claim um, around net zero greenhouse gases by 2040. I've highlighted this because they've recently been called out on this, that they have set this claim, but they actually don't have any way of achieving this. And this is one of the things that is coming. They, these companies have made these pledges. They haven't yet worked out how they're going to meet them. And so, but you're part of that story because you're their producers and you're, the, you're part of their supply chain. So they will be looking to you to pick up and reduce some of their emissions. And in some way, they'll have to incentivize so that you can do that. And because these companies are often have a commercial imperative to do this, uh, and often are a lot bigger than even some of the economies that we're working at a national level, I suspect this is how you will be interacting in this space, not through a government project. Government might help, but the ERF, which is our current method for doing this, I think will become a secondary uh, approach as we go forward. One of the other ones that I wanted to highlight was Rabobank. Um, and this, we're already starting to see this, that some of the banks are offering lower interest for producers who can demonstrate uh, lower emission credentials. And again, because you're part of their supply chain, you're considered in some of their, in their scope three emissions, which is their down supply chain emissions. So there will be many ways that this will impact you. Uh, and I just wanted to highlight that it's, uh, what we're talking here will, will have impacts on you uh, through, through your business. Um, what I've got up here is just a quick snapshot of the inventory of emissions for New South Wales. Um, and probably the, the key one here is agriculture. And when you look at that, you think beauty, we're, we're reducing our emissions. Um, and we have uh, in agriculture in, um, in New South Wales in, in the order of 30%. But what does that come from, that a reduction? It's been a reduction in our sheep numbers as in New South Wales, a lot of our producers have shifted from sheep production into crop production. That's not going to continue. So we've had a free hit. When you actually look at it on an efficiency basis, so are we reducing the emissions per head, 
there hasn't been a big shift yet. So we have a lot of work to do uh, to start making these uh, changes. The other thing I wanted to point out is when we're looking at these inventories, you see this uh, one that's called land use change, which is the green here that's either can be an emission up the top or a, or a sink down the bottom. That is related to generally our vegetation change, but also uh, soil carbon. So when we start accounting for emissions, if you're growing a whole heap of trees on your farm and they've been thickening, they're not actually going to show up here in our agricultural emissions. They're going to show up in this land use change emission. And so while we can, uh, they're already accounting for this on a uh, sort of statewide um, uh, scale, a national scale, we're not yet doing this at farm level. And this is sort of where I think we're starting to head is uh, there'll be, and we can already do this, we can, we can work out what your emissions are at a farm level and then work out pathways to, to actually uh, reduce those emissions. Um, and this is just to give you an idea of some of the emissions in um, some farming systems that you might be familiar with. Um, there's, a f there's two things that I wanted to, to point out with this. The first is um, when you look at a beef production system and a sheep production system will have a very similar profile. Most of our emissions in the order of 90% are, are enteric methane. So it's, it's, um, it's coming from your livestock. All the stuff around uh, electricity use, diesel use on farm is, is um, and, and the pre-farm stuff is a very small part of your emissions. It comes down to livestock. And when you look at agriculture emissions in Australia, livestock are 70% of those emissions. So as a livestock producer, uh, you're going to be at the forefront of the ac actions that are going to come to, to reduce emissions in agriculture. You'll have to take part. Um, and when we, the, the other thing is when we're looking at our cropping systems, most of the main uh, emissions are from nitrous oxide that come from either the production of fertiliser or uh, fertiliser use in the soil, nitrogen fertiliser in the soil. And so, um, and then we also have this um, uh, portion here around residues. So all your residues that are breaking down the paddock are also potentially producing nitrous oxide. But when you're looking at this on a, uh, what we call an intensity basis, our grain products are producing a lot less emissions per unit of product than what our animal products are. So how can we reduce these uh, options? There's, there's a lot of things that are available. And there's, there's probably two parts to this. There's the avoided emissions. And these are the things that are lowest at risk. So, so once, and, and the reason I say this is, once you've avoided an emission, you don't have to ever worry about it again. You've, you've taken an action, you've stopped an emission, and it's in the past. When we start thinking about uh, sequestration, which has been a very large part of the talk at the moment, that's about looking into the future. So you're offsetting an emission, and then you need to maintain that additional carbon that you've stored for 2,500 years if we're looking at an ERF project. But all intents and purposes, you need to look at maintaining that into the future for a long period of time. And to you, there is a risk in doing that because the climate's changing, your production system's changing, a lot of things are likely, prices and costs are going to change in the future. So if you're looking at what you would do at a farm, these things around avoiding emissions uh, should be a very high priority for you. And so some of the things that you've probably heard about, um, 3 nop and asparagopsis, these are supplements that are being fed to animals. So at the moment they're mainly focused around feedlots. Um, and they haven't really sought out good approaches for delivering these in, in grazing just yet, but this is a big research area at the moment. The next one's around the efficiencies of systems, and when we're looking at this from a, um, from a government ERF methods that, that are available, um, those are relatively large scale, um, so probably still not available to you as a producer in this, this part of the world. And then we've got some things that are coming up like anti-methanogenic pastures. So pastures that will actually lower emissions of your animals. And they will start to increase in, in um, they're, they're coming as well. But if, if you were to say you could do all of these things now, 
but there's not really a way for you to account for it and get, get a benefit. And so that's a, that's a key thing. Um, where these things here, there is. We've got ERF methods that you can take part in and do that. So I'm just going to start to focus in on soil carbon today. Um, the key thing about soil carbon is it's this balance between inputs and outputs. So it's a bank of nutrients and carbon that is in your soil. And uh, those, that input and output relationship means it changes. And so one of the key things we're trying to do with sequestration is we're trying to build it up and store more, which means we're trying to, usually we're trying to increase the inputs, how much organic matter is going back into the soil from additional plant growth. Um, we can limit the microbial turnover, well, that's generally by reducing disturbance. So we're not ploughing it, we're not um, uh, disturbing the soil as much. Um, what is soil carbon? It's not the plant material you can see on the top of the soil. It's the stuff that's less than two millimetres. And you can slice and dice that a few different ways, but we generally break it up into a few pools. Um, particulate carbon, that's the newly formed carbon that's a bit coarser in the soil. Um, the humus carbon, um, which is humus is probably a term that's going out of favour, but it's the carbon in the soil that is usually stabilised to some degree, so it's usually mineral associated with the clay particles in your soil, which helps store that a bit and it's more resistant. Uh, and then we have the resistant, which is your charcoal, and that can be stable in the soil for thousands of years, but it generally doesn't change much. And Australian soils have a lot of charcoal in them because of uh, previous burning history. So the, the, I, I want, if you're thinking about soil carbon, there's a few things that you need to understand is that when you're looking at the potential for a paddock, one paddock is not the same potential as the next paddock or the next farm over. There's a unique set of uh, circumstances in each paddock which determine how much carbon you can store. Um, so the first thing that determines that is your, your soil type which is primarily the clay portion of the soil, which helps to bind that organic matter, um, and also the mineralogy, so the types of clays in the soil, which um, it's associated with how many binding sites you've got for that carbon to, to actually um, link onto. The next thing, uh, and so we, we, we might talk that as a potential. So a soil type has a potential of carbon that it can store. Clay soils are higher, sandy soils are much lower. Uh, then we've got this attainable carbon, which is driven by the climate. So the next, climate is, a, is, a, is another massive factor in how much um, carbon you can store, and that's A, related to the growth, so the rainfall that's driving the productivity on that side, but it's also um, the temperature and um, that also drives the degradation side of soil carbon as well. And then we come down to what's the actual soil carbon, and that's then related to the management. So what have you done in that paddock over the last 10 to 50 years that as is actually determining how much carbon is there. So what I'm saying is the first two of those you can't change. They're set. The only thing you can change is your management. So a large part of when you're starting to look at this massive variation in soil carbon across your landscape is driven by those top two. Your management is usually a smaller amount and it's a slower moving amount that you can actually affect soil carbon. So if people are talking about really high rates of change or big differences in soil carbon, they're actually generally looking at error around the top two, not so much what's actually changed due to management. Um, this is a little bit, uh, looks a, a little bit busy, but I just want to, this point is a, is a key concept when you're looking at soil carbon, is that it has, um, a plateau that you reach. So this is from the Rothamsted experiment in, that's in the UK. So uh, a farming system experiment that's been running for 150 years or something. And so they've used this data to build um, a lot of our soil carbon models. And what we find is we have this initial period of change in, in soil carbon that's often quite rapid when we change land management. And in this case, it was putting on compost. Um, but eventually over time, as you're putting that same amount of compost on year in, year out, you eventually reach a new equilibrium and that plateaus out. But if we do that same thing, we put a bit of, say, compost on and, and, and then we don't put any more on, we stop putting that on, the, um, 
sill carbon then starts to drop back because it's not going to keep increasing. And you're not even going to start to maintain it at that same level unless you start to put, keep putting something back into it. So, and eventually you get back to your state of where you were before you started. So the key thing about land management change with um, soil carbon is you have to keep doing it into the future. And you, so if you, if you change and you sow a, a, a high input um, pasture, it's got a lot of fertiliser under it, you have to keep putting that on and you have to keep maintaining that productivity into the future or the carbon will drop back. Um, there's, there's a bit of detail here, but the key thing that I wanted to show is that we can often have a lot of variability in soil carbon at the paddock level. So this is from a site where we did um, some grazing trials over at Panuara. We also looked at soil carbon under that um, over a number of years. We just decide, divide this paddock up into three zones, a low production zone, medium and high, um, which is shown by the different colours down here. Um, but the key thing is the, the highest production areas had almost double the soil carbon of the low production areas. Um, and that variability is quite a lot. So when you might be hearing someone saying that they're coming to measure soil carbon on your place and they're going to put seven cores um, in, a, in a zone across your paddock, um, the, it is unlikely that they are going to be able to cover the variability in that paddock you need a high level of cores to build certainty around how much carbon you've got in different... And this variability is one of our biggest challenges in actually documenting how much carbon we've got and why measurement is such a challenge uh, with this and, and why, at the moment, there is very few projects that actually have um, uh, uh, been awarded carbon under the ERF at the moment. So I'm just going to go through a few of the, the common land management practices that we have. Uh, for, that we know um, uh, or people are interested in to build carbon. So this is um, converting cropping to pasture. We have a high degree of confidence that this works. Um, we've done a lot of studies. So we did um, some work under the National Soil Carbon Research Project in this area where we sampled 400 odd paddocks from, um, from Hay to, to Oberon. And where we had mixed farming systems, uh, over, I think there was about an average of five years those phase farm, uh, those, those pasture phases were in. And over those five, um, five years, it was about 0.78 tonnes of carbon per hectare you could store over that five year period. Again, when we look at the soil carbon pilot that I'm going to talk to uh, here is about, in this region, it was about 0.74. So pretty consistent. We can predict that five years is, a, is an easy amount and we have confidence in that. Once we get you know, uh, a bit longer, there's less data, but it's, it, it drops off. Um, and it's somewhere in the order of 0 0.26, uh, 0 0.4 from previous studies, but there's a little bit of cropping in some of those as well. So um, if you're looking to convert from uh, cropping to pasture, there, there is an opportunity there. Um, grazing management is, is, is a very popular one uh, and gets promoted a lot. Um, we've just um, completed a, um, a meta-analysis on this. So what a meta-analysis is, is where we look at all the studies that have been done in the past in Australia and we look at how many of our, well, well, is there uh, a significant change due to management action. The two things we looked at here were rotational grazing versus continuous and then high versus low stocking rate. The interesting thing here is if you look at soil carbon here, so it's not significantly different from zero in either of these, means that we haven't been able to monitor it in experiments in Australia. There could be a few reasons for that. Uh, one, the trials haven't gone for long enough when you're looking at small changes. Um, seasonal variation and um, uh, also that massive variability that I'm talking about, which means that there's a lot of error around these measurements. But the, when we look at the key things that do drive some of these things, so biomass, herbage mass, cover, there are changes. So we do expect to see um, some change in soil carbon with grazing management. Um, we've been running a grazing trial up at the research station in Orange for uh, since 2012, and we've been monitoring, we baseline that for soil carbon uh, when we started, and we've uh, been following that through with measurements roughly every three years um, since that. With this trial, we, we set it up to look at different forms of intensive rotational grazing. 
and comparing that to set stocking. Uh, and we also did it at a couple of different stocking rates, so that we've got it at a, at a basic a high utilisation system and a lower utilisation system. Um, and, and so this is the data there. So one of the key things is that there has been an increase. So that pasture was sown sort of a few years before we started this trial. So we've, we're getting this general increase in soil carbon across that site because of that pasture establishment. Um, but there's not a lot. Generally, all the rotations were, were basically increasing carbon. And, in, and the, the continuous grazing treatments here were actually um, lower. So, so there is, is data, but we had this, it took 10 years to actually pick this out, and the, the differences are small. So for here, if we look at this, so this is a continuous grazing, and this is just a 15 paddock rotation and a 30 paddock rotation. So when we look at this down to 30 centimetres, uh, it's, it's about, uh, the continuous grazing was storing about half a tonne of carbon per hectare, where the additional carbon for that grazing management is only um, is uh, 0.69 or 0.66. So that from grazing management, you're, you're not picking up a huge amount of extra carbon in that system um, beyond. What's your uh, animal production difference on that? Like, do you um, lose it on the extra methane coming back out? We're doing those analysis at the moment, so to, to try and work out where that optimum is. But um, at the moment, say, uh, any rotation that had a higher stocking rate was basically more productive in, in that system. The, the lower stocking rate was, was um, uh, while it was degrading in the dry years, you, you gave away too much production in the good years. Quick summary. <laughs> um, the next one I wanted to talk to you about was um, um, increasing soil nu nutrients. Um, so improving soil fertility um, can increase carbon, and th there's a lot of uh, evidence of this. So I'm just going to give you an example of this from a uh, pasture side and from a cropping side. Uh, and the reasons it's important is, is it not only builds plant productivity, so you've got more growth and um, that's going back into the soil to build carbon, you actually provide nutrients that help stabilise that carbon. So one of the key things is you when you get that newly formed organic matter going back into the soil, to generally to stabilise it, it has to go through uh, microbes. And the most efficient, those microbes reply, require the same nutrients that your plants do. So unless those nutrients are there, then those bugs can't convert that coarse material back into a more stable or humus form. And so that stabilisation of high nutrients is a key part as well. Um, so this is uh, from a long-term experiment. So um, this was a, a long-term phosphorus trial that was run in Girondera by, um, uh, by CSIRO. Um, there was a student, Liz Coonan, who sampled this at the end uh, of, that, um, of that experiment. And basically over 20 years, uh, when they looked at no, no phosphorus fertiliser over 20 years compared to a high rate of phosphorus fertiliser, it was roughly about half a tonne of carbon per hectare per year that was stored with that high phosphorus. Um, it also added about 42 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare per year as well from the legumes that were stimulated by, from the use of that, that phosphorus. So uh, it, it, it is, uh, and here it's just looking at the depth profile for that. So most of it occurs at the soil surface, but we also see a little bit that's occurring down the profile as well. But this is a generally pretty consistent um, what we see with different land uses is most of the difference is at the su surface um, and we don't see as much change down deep. Um, I know there's a lot of claims out there that things, these big things happen deep in the soil. If you're not seeing it happen at the surface, it's very unlikely that it's happening down below. And because there's less carbon down here, there's just less change that can happen as well. So. Um, I'm not convinced or I haven't seen any data to say that there's anything special happening in depth that we're not seeing at the soil surface. When we say soil surface, that's the top 30 centimetres. Um, this is a cropping example here where um, they actually um, added additional nutrients um, and they added enough nutrients to stabilise 30% of the crop residue that was going back in. So this was done by a guy called Clive Kirkby um, at CSIRO. So um, that plus nutrient treatment 
um, degraded 76% of a nine ton stubble over a summer compared to where that additional nutrient wasn't put on, where only 12% of that stubble was degraded. So that additional nutrients helped the microbes break that stubble down. Um, over five year period, it ended up being an extra 8.7 tonnes of carbon per hectare, uh, down to 1.6 um, uh, metre. Interestingly, last night, I just saw a paper come through um, that's followed up on this work um, five years later. So what they did is they put that nutrient back, um, kept that nutrient going for a further five year, uh, further two years, and they saw that they were able to maintain those gains. But they then followed it for three years after they took the nutrient away, and lo and behold, that stabilised soil carbon reduced. So the key thing about a nutrient strategy is if you're going to go down this way to build carbon, you have to keep doing it. Is that because the bacteria? Decline. Um, it's, it's about the deficiencies in the soil. So if it, um, that is then turning over and the plants are using that, or if there's a shortage of nutrients in the soil, then the microbes start to use the organic matter to, to access um, the nutrient that, to make it available for plants, for themselves first, and then that cycles back through for the plant. So all of these, uh, and this is what I just wanted to keep highlighting, if you start these land use changes, you have to keep them going. You can't just do something once uh, and hope that it will. The only thing that will is likely to do that is something like biochar, where you're actually applying a very stable form of carbon. Which um, the other thing that they did, uh, I actually converted this from, from the, the, the cost of fertilizer but they it basically, they thought it was around 500, uh, at the time they thought it was around $250 a tonne of carbon that was stabilised um, in, in input costs. The input costs have basically doubled since that, that um, uh, experiment started, uh, was run. So I said it's about $500 a tonne uh, of carbon to be stabilised if you were putting all those nutrients on. The reality is we're not putting all those nutrients on, we're, we're using legumes and other things to, to provide that additional nitrogen. All those additional nutrients would be really boosting your yields and stuff. They're banked in the soil. So yes, you, 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 they're building in yields, yes, and you're getting use for those, but this is, you have to apply additional nutrient beyond that productivity benefit to keep getting that. You have to have more nutrient in the system, if that makes sense. You have to have an excess. Um, I better keep moving. Um, so this one is just from a long-term study, uh, farming systems trial that was done out at Condoblin, where uh, we followed um, soil carbon under continuous cropping, um, perennial pasture, and two rotational systems, one under continuous uh, uh, high tillage and one under um, uh, reduced tillage. Basically, all the, um, we, we found this build-up in soil carbon for uh, 12 years, and then we lost all that carbon within uh, three years. The perennial pasture, which was highest here, was also the highest at the end. But when we looked at it, it was all this particular carbon that had built up. So when I was talking about that carbon that's coarse and stable uh, in the soil, we're able to pin why it reduced here. It wasn't an obvious climate event. Um, the only thing that I can say is that when we looked at the soil carbon um, in the farms in the same soil type around here, they were all around 1% or lower and we were up here around 2%. So it was probably substantially higher than that, in, than that environment could sustain. Uh, and it all built up in this uh, particular carbon. So just um, in summary, um, soil carbon is a high risk uh, emissions reduction strategy because its application is time limited. So you're only getting benefit for a period of time uh, the soil carbon needs to be maintained for long periods of time, 25 to 100 years. And the thing that we need to consider is our climate is changing and it is changing quite rapidly. Um, and the environment in 25 years time alone will be substantially harsher than it is at the moment. Um, expected changes in soil carbon are often small and difficult to detect. So it does happen, 
and we know it happens and we probably have a fair idea of why, but they're difficult to detect because of that variability. Um, and those labile forms of carbon can be easily lost. So if it's not stabilised, and even when it is stabilised, if you don't maintain that uh, management, it can be lost. But there are opportunities for soil carbon. Uh, in areas where soil carbon is currently low for the soil type and climate, there is a possibility to build carbon. So if you improve your management, you will build carbon and you can document that change. Where changes in land management are implemented that, to support data. So you need to do things that are, we know will, will build carbon. Um, and finally, if we're boosting our productivity um, through improved nutrients, then there's a high opportunity to, to build carbon as well. Okay, um, thank you. Just um, acknowledgement to all the people who've helped contribute to that work. Well.